Hello and welcome to Aircraft Grade, the podcast all about commercial aviation. I'm your host Alex and coming up this week, Volatea facing large expansion after 717 fleet retirement, IATA's latest industry predictions, UK travel bookings and Heathrow, the latest on the bleak situation at Norwegian Air and the United Airlines 777 leaves a trail of debris after suffering an engine failure over Denver. Before we take a deep dive into our main topics, let's first round up the key aviation stories from the last week, giving you my opinion along the way. Like last week, I have some more positive Airbus A340-300 news. Swiss airline Edelweiss is looking to reduce its long-haul fleet by one-third. Currently, they field a fleet of four A340s and two A330s. Naturally, it makes sense for the airline to withdraw its A330s temporarily to maintain a uniform aircraft type for its long-haul fleet. I love the A340 and I think this is fantastic news, even if they aren't as efficient as the twin-engined A330. Although this measure is temporary, with the airline still planning on replacing the A340s by 2025. ANA have come up with a unique way to cut CO2 emissions by making its in-flight magazines digital only. The airline states that the change will result in a reduction in CO2 emissions by 1,540 tonnes. As you know, I'm all for a cleaner future for aviation and this change is fascinating to me. Boeing has predicted that Latin America will need 2,610 new aircraft by 2040. This shows that Boeing is clearly predicting a positive future and it shows how much potential growth the Latin America region has. Some very good news. Panasonic and Bandai Namco have recently announced a partnership to bring the best retro 80s games on in-flight entertainment systems. This falls alongside the comeback of retro games in recent years and was bound to happen at some point. I hope when I can travel again, airlines would have implemented this because it sounds really cool. In January this year, Spanish airline Volatea said goodbye to their fleet of Boeing 717s. The planes were retired after completing their last flights to Genoa, Palermo, Catania, Cagliari, Turin, Naples and Verona on January 10th. After operating their last flights, the last 717s in Europe arrived in Venice Airport before being retired in Victorville, California. The news of Volatea's 717 retirement came in wake of gradual replacements of the type for Airbus A319s. The Spanish carrier has had a very strong connection with the type. When the airline commenced operations out of Venice's Marco Polo Airport in 2012, it did so with two 717s. One came from Midwest Airlines in December 2011. The plane is currently 16 years old and has been with Hawaiian since early 2017. In 2012 and 2013, Volatea had 12 more 717s delivered and 2014 and 2015 saw the final six arrive. Volatea had chosen to operate their 717s with 125 seats. The airline has operated a total of 19 since its debut, but only two were officially listed as active when the remaining fleet was retired. Their replacements? Airbus A319s. The first Volatea A319 arrived in the fleet in March of 2017, with the airline now currently fielding a fleet of 21, with three more due in the coming weeks. Recently, Volatea has begun considering expanding their fleet of A320s since their switch to an all Airbus fleet. The airline is planning to add 15 new Airbuses to replace the 14 retired 717s. Their order will contain a mix of larger A320s and smaller A319s. This large acquisition has potential to boost the airline's fleet to 35 aircraft, with the option for four more if demand is there. Their decision makes sense, with the CEO, Carlos Manos, saying that the A320 series will reduce operating costs by 20-25% to over the older 717s. The fleet will significantly reduce their carbon footprint and reduce their noise impact on the cities and bases they operate in. With the airline only operating one family of aircraft, they can now benefit from advantages like pilots only needing one licence, lower maintenance costs, simplified scheduling, easier monitoring and increased auditing in safety. Other airlines seem to be following this strategy. For example, Air Baltic have recently retired all their old fleet in favour of becoming an all Airbus A220 airline. These ambitious expansion plans have the capability to be very fruitful, with Volatea managing to maintain a 90.7% load factor in the decimation that was 2020. They took advantage of efficient route planning and the large domestic market within Europe. 
Volatea plan to build on their success with targets for an even more profitable 2021, helped dearly by their fleet modernisation programme. Volatea was Europe's last operator of the 717, as all other European carriers have since ceased operations. Blue One had operated nine 717s between 2010 and 2015, after acquiring five of the type from Quantum Air, before being absorbed into SAS. Blue One had also received three from Olympic Air. Another European operator, Span Air, had also once operated four 717s, and you guessed it, they've since stopped operations. So with Europe's last operator, the Boeing 717, having now abandoned the type, does anyone still operate them? Well, actually yes, Qantas Lynx still have 20, and Hawaiian Airlines still have 13. But these are pitiful numbers compared to the 85 that Delta Airlines still has in its over 760 strong fleet. Volatea was only a Boeing 717 operator for a short amount of time, barely 10 years, and yet its retirement of the type is so significant. But why? Well, the 717 is such an iconic plane with a rich history and it removes another uniquely designed and styled plane from our skies. But should we care? Well, there's an argument that says we shouldn't. As previously mentioned, newer generation jets are 20 to 25% cheaper to operate and better for the environment. In order for a cleaner and more sustainable future, these legends of the sky need to be sent into retirement. However sad. So as the 717 follows the likes of the A340, 747 and A380, that is another iconic airliner being retired out of existence. Volatea will continue to benefit from an inefficient fleet, and if their 2020 form is anything to go by, I think they have a bright future ahead of them. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has recently announced plans to leave lockdown and open the country back up again. Within hours of the announcement, British travellers hurry to secure flights to their favourite holiday destinations. Although it's made clear that guidelines will still apply, the country is looking to permit foreign holidays by May 17th. The announcement, at first glance, seems like a saving grace for airlines and the tourism sector. Andrew Flintham, Managing Director of TUI UK and Ireland, told Airways magazine the announcement from the Prime Minister was positive and shows that by working with the travel industry on a risk-based framework, our customers will have the opportunity to travel abroad this summer. All major UK carriers have reported surges in bookings. Destinations like Malaga, Alicante, Palma, Faro and Crete have been the most popular, according to UK Airlines. Additionally, EasyJet has seen an increase of 337% in the numbers of flight bookings, with their package holidays also increasing by a whopping 630%. On the surface, this seems fantastic, however the spike in bookings needs to be taken with a grain of salt. If COVID-19 cases surge in the UK, or holiday destinations, then international travel could quite easily be halted once again. This uncertainty is backed up by IATA, who doesn't expect the industry to even break even in 2021. IATA have said they now believe that airlines won't turn cash positive before year's end after discovery of new COVID variants, forcing borders to close once again. This is in contrast to their most recent December global aviation market forecast, which predicted a difficult first and second quarter, but a more profitable and successful second half of the year. However, since this report, as previously stated, new variants have been discovered, shutting down countries again. IATA presented a re-evaluated forecast for 2021, which would see an end-of-year recovery of between 33 and 38% from 2019 levels, depending on how quickly countries are opened up. This is a decrease from the 51% recovery that was initially predicted. Despite these seemingly negative predictions, IATA have stressed they expect a steep recovery in the second half of the year with a strong end to 2021. Heathrow are clearly struggling as well, as they've requested that airports should be exempt from property tax from the UK's finance minister, Rishi Sunak. This isn't unusual during Covid as other sectors have been afforded this exemption. Heathrow leaders have argued that they've been hit hard by the pandemic, with them racking up losses of over £2 billion for 2020, carrying 73% less passengers than in 2019, with them also losing their busiest airport in Europe status. Heathrow is predicting that in the second quarter of 2021, they'll carry 25 million passengers, half of their normal capacity. However, much like airlines, they are acutely aware of the effect new strains of the virus and the openness of borders may have on, in their recovery, with them believing in the IATA travel pass as the best solution. 
So what's my take as someone who wants to go into the industry as a pilot in the next couple of years? Well, I'm optimistic. While I agree this year will be difficult for airlines, I also believe that once the government have opened up the country again, they'd struggle to justify locking it down. Furthermore, I believe people will be desperate and are to go away, so I think the surge in demand will continue in 2021. I also think business travel will come back as well, contrary to what many believe. This is because Zoom meetings are great, but nothing quite beats a face-to-face meeting. The future is looking positive, and I'm optimistic for the aviation industry's recovery, even if progress starts slow. Norwegian Air has been struggling to turn a profit for a long time. They were caught out by the 737 MAX groundings and 787 engine problems, amongst other things. And as part of its recent restructuring, they've also completely axed their long-haul fleet of 787 Dreamliners, returning them to their lessers. And Norwegian has just posted losses of over 2.6 billion US dollars for 2020. As part of this restructuring, Norwegian Air has been in front of the Irish High Court to assess the validity of its debt liabilities. While no official decisions and outcomes have been released, there have been rumours of their large Boeing and Airbus orders being cancelled. Norwegian are planning on coming out of its restructuring with a narrow-body fleet cut in half and hoping to become smaller and more efficient. Well, these rumours appear to come true. On Wednesday, it was confirmed that Norwegian has reached an agreement with Airbus to cancel its 88-strong aircraft order. Some standout jets in the Norwegian order included 30 A321LRs for long-haul operations, which, of course, they have now discontinued. For more information about the A321LR, make sure to listen to last week's aircraft grade, an Airbus anniversary. One key detail from the Norwegian Airbus deal is that Airbus will keep any prepayments made and the airline still owes almost US$850,000. The Airbus order was originally made in 2012, where Norwegian agreed to purchase 100 aircraft. However, this order was revised multiple times, with Airbus stating that the current order stood for 88 jets. Norwegian had always been an all-Boeing airline, so this order seemed odd in my opinion, but alas, that order is no more. In terms of the Boeing orders, well, no one really knows its fate. Last year, Norwegian had declared they would cancel their 97 aircraft order from the US aerospace megagiant. Norwegian tried to cancel the order under the reason that the planes had various issues, and they still continue to seek compensation from Boeing due to the 737 MAX groundings. However, according to Boeing, the order still stands. But watch this space. The Irish High Court is still in session, and new announcements could be coming soon. So a quick disclaimer before we get on to our next piece. I'm about to talk about an aviation incident which is still currently under investigation and likely will be for a long time. The information regarding this incident is constantly evolving, so bear that in mind. Saturday the 20th appeared to be a day for aircraft engine failures. A Boeing 747 converted freighter and a United Airlines 777 operating Flight 328 from Denver to Honolulu. The 26-year-old aircraft suffered an engine failure, leaving a trail of debris over the city of Denver. The engine failure happened around five minutes into the flight and was very dramatic indeed. The 777 involved was the fifth ever built, and it was one of a minority powered by Pratt & Whitney PW4000 series of engines. The incident was so bizarre because it discarded debris all over the district of Broomfield. Naturally, this creates a major problem in the investigation that succeeded the incident. The public were quickly told to not touch any found debris and reported to the NTSB, the agency in charge of the investigation. So what makes this incident so unique? Well, after watching videos posted by passengers online, it's quite easy to see why. The front cowling of engine 2 has completely broken off and the outer engine casing is completely missing. This shows an exposed engine vibrating violently on fire. Also, upon inspection on the ground, a piece of the fuselage also had a large hole taken out of it. The aircraft safely landed on runway 26 at Denver Airport and eventfully at 13.37 local time with no injuries. But what happened exactly? Well, let's take a look at what we know so far. On Tuesday the 23rd, the NTSB, the agency investigating the engine failure, released images showing the size of the damage the 777 operating Flight 328 sustained. The photos of the engine show that two fan blades had received significant damage. One had sheared off at the base, and another one had broken further up. 
Additionally, the NTSB has said that a portion of a fan blade was found inside the engine's containment ring, with all other fan blades having received damage to their tips and leading edges. NTSB chairman Robert Sumwatt has said that initial evidence points to the fan blade fractures being consistent with metal fatigue. The piece of fuselage that was damaged was also identified to be an aero piece, or in other words, non-critical. It's worth noting that despite how dramatic the whole incident was, experts are hesitant to define it as an uncontained engine failure, because an uncontainable failure is defined as the inability of the engine casing to prevent high energy rotating parts remaining within the engine in the event of fragmentation. If this were to happen, other aircraft systems would be susceptible to substantial damage. This didn't happen as the engine on United 328 did technically contain the initial debris from the damaged fan blades even if most of the external housing was destroyed. United 328 used Pratt & Whitney PW4000 engines which are only found on select 777-200 and 300s. These engines are fascinating because they feature hollow fan blades and even more interestingly this type of engine has suffered this kind of failure before, actually fairly recently. In December 2020, Japan Airlines flight JL904 from Okinawa Naha Airport experienced a similar fan blade failure and partial loss of engine cowling shortly after takeoff. It also returned and landed safely. And on February 12, 2018, another United 777, flight 1175 from San Francisco to Honolulu, suffered an engine failure over the Pacific. The aircraft had exactly the same configuration as the jet used on United 328. The outcome of the investigation on this flight determined that the fan blade inside the engine fractured, leading to the failure, with Pratt & Whitney being faulted for not doing thorough enough inspections. The most recent incident has caused the grounding of all PW4000 powered 777s after an emergency airworthiness directive was released on the 22nd. A total of 124 aircraft across six airlines have been affected, mainly based in Asia. These engines seem to severely suffer from metal fatigue, something Boeing was acutely aware of, with internal documents reporting that there have been plans to redesign engine covers in the future. Now it's again worth noting this incident is still under investigation, so we don't know the true source of the incident, but metal fatigue looks likely. The Wall Street Journal says that Boeing was planning to strengthen the protective engine covers on its 777 aircraft, months before the incident. Some even suggest the issue was known about for over two years, an issue discovered after the aforementioned 2018 United Airlines failure. So why weren't these design changes implemented? So although we can't be 100% sure, we can make some predictions. Any substantial structural changes in an engine require a lot of regulatory and certification roadblocks, things that take time and money. And these types of failures are very rare, so this fix would be fairly low priority. Usually, engines are designed to eject broken fan blades out the back, however in the Japan Airlines incident and both United incidents, the fractured blades seem to have been shot forwards damaging the engine covers. Oh, and one last nail in the coffin for Pratt & Whitney. You know the 747-400 BCF incident I briefly mentioned earlier? Let's go back to that. On the same day as United 328, a long-tail aviation cargo 747 suffered an uncontained engine failure of the Dutch city of Maastricht after departure, injuring two people from falling debris. The engine used PW4056s, an early version of the PW4000s. Now, this is purely speculation, but could these engines have suffered from the same design fault? It seems likely. So what happens now? Well, like I said, all PW4000 powered 777s have been grounded until further notice, and the NTSB say the engine that failed will be removed for additional inspection, and the section of a blade has also been flown to the Pratt & Whitney labs after being overnighted on a private jet. The Bureau have also begun moving pieces of debris to a hangar for further inspection, and agents in Washington DC have begun to analyse the cockpit, voice and data recorders. Once again, this incident is still under investigation and new information and discoveries will continue to be released, so make sure to keep an eye out for any news. I also highly recommend you watch the videos of the incident, as videos definitely explain to failure better than I can over a podcast. And on one final note from me, my two cents if you will, a lot of people on Twitter went straight to calling Boeing planes unsafe. And maybe the incident was Boeing's fault, we don't know yet. So I'd recommend holding your judgement for who's accountable until the final report gets released a couple of months down the line. Now it's time to cover the most important airplane orders and deliveries over the last week. 
British Airways has announced it will take delivery of its first 18 777X jets between 2024 and 2027, two years behind schedule. JetBlue has received its first Airbus A321neo featuring its new business class Mint cabin. For more info on JetBlue's new Mint, check out episode 4 of Aircraft Grade, A Brighter Future. Dutch flag carrier KLM has taken delivery of its first Embraer E195 E2 jet. KLM has total orders for 25, with options for 10 more, with the new jets operating for KLM City Hopper. In less significant deliveries, Indigo, China Eastern, Shenzhen Airlines, ANA, Ajana, Volaris and Spring Airlines have all received A320 Neo family of jets. Southwest has received two 737 Maxes and United, Delta and American have received Embraer ERJs and Bombardier CRJs. DHL and UPS have just received 767 freighters. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you for listening to the Aircraft Grade podcast. If you enjoy it, please leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your favourite podcast player. If you do have any feedback, you can tweet us at aircraftgrade or DM us on Instagram. If you do enjoy this podcast, please make sure to share it to any of your aviation-loving friends. I've been Alex. Have a decently average week. Goodbye. Goodbye.